both equal parts exciting and terrifying. Known as the black arts, the newly emerging techniques of commercial photography were often spoken about as though they were a mysterious or even supernatural process. Of course, there was nothing supernatural about the new technology, at least not for most photographers. When William Mumler picked it up as a hobby, lured in by his attraction to a local studio owner and a propensity to tinker, he decided to lean into the mystery by offering a spy hole into the unseen world of the dead, shooting portraits of clients sitting alongside. The technological breakthroughs of the 19th century were, to many people, when the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Season 4, Episode 12 of Dark Histories. I'm Ben, as always. I hope you're all doing very well. The weather in this part of the world has definitely been picking up and it seems like things are slowly turning back to normal. Like I say, right back at the start of all the craziness of this year, I did mention that, you know, I wasn't going to try and talk about it too much because I see this podcast as an escape. But just a short one in the introduction here, like... Over the last few sort of episodes, I've basically um, been having to work off of my own bookshelf and, and that's about it. Obviously, with the internet, I've had quite a little bit of stuff I could research there as well, but I've very much been limited in my research to what I can get that's readily available, for example. And I'm, I'm sort of running out of topics that I have stuff to hand for um, because I did have like a backlog of things which... I'd already collected a lot of research materials for. But fortunately, things are starting to open up and get a little bit back to normal. Things are starting to slowly, sort of very slowly shift into sort of normal world again or the new normal. So hopefully, like going forward, I can sort of tuck into some new subjects, which I, you know, and, and start sort of using interesting avenues for research again and sort of branching off of my bookshelf, which will be really great. So yeah, looking forward to that. Looking forward to the second half this year. Say so the, the weather's been picking up and everything seems like it's getting there. So, so you know, I just thought a little quick update, a little bit of positivity maybe. I hope you're all sort of remaining healthy and, and getting through it as well. On to this week's episode. And before we begin, as always, I want to say thank you, like a massive thank you to everyone who supports. So whether that be leaving reviews or sharing the podcast, but obviously, you know, the patrons, um, who sort of financially keep the show running. Thank you very much for your support. It's always very humbling and, and super kind. So thanks very much. Uh, new patrons we've got for this episode are Nick, Milo, Dave, Alex, Mary, Louise, Beth, Tracy, Danny Ecker, Ben, Brett, Caitlin, Jill, Kieran, Leif, Fran, Aaron, Rowena, Vic, Kathleen, James, Tracy, Laurie, Margaret, Roxanne, Lou, Chris, John, Jackie, Randall and Deanna. So thank you very much. It's a massive list and it's always, say, incredibly humbling every time someone signs up to support, um, especially at the moment. So yeah, thank you so much for all your help and sort of keeping the podcast going and keeping me alive pretty much at this point. So, yeah, thank you very much. So, yeah, let's get on with this week's episode. It's a fun one. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I always say that, I think. I think you probably get, you know, you've probably heard that every every episode. But, yeah, no, I enjoyed it. So um, I hope you enjoy it as well. It's called Photography, Spiritualism and the World of William Mumler. In a small farmhouse cottage in Hyesville, New York, 14-year-old Maggie and 11-year-old Kate lay awake listening intently to the knocks, thuds and raps that had sounded throughout their room every night for the past month. The young sister's mother, Margaret, was terrified. She'd heard rumours shortly after they moved into the house three months prior in December of 1847 that a peddler had been murdered on the property and had taken it very much to heart. Margaret had quickly become convinced that every creak of a door or thump on a floorboard was the manifestation of the peddler's ghost haunting the property and now her daughters were apparently attempting to communicate with it. Mr Splitfoot, as they called the spirit, was clearly keen to dance to the young girl's tune 
dutifully repeating a series of knocks after they'd asked it to do as I do. Despite her fear, Margaret's curiosity got the better of her and she tentatively began to question the ghost herself. I then asked if it was a human being that was making the noise and if it was, to manifest it by the same noise. There was no noise. I then asked if it was a spirit and if it was, to manifest it by two sounds. I heard two sounds as soon as the words were spoken. I then asked if it was an injured spirit to give me the sound and I heard the rapping distinctly. I then asked if it was injured in this house and it manifested it by the noise. If the person was living that injured it and got the same answer, I then ascertained by the same method that its remains were buried under the dwelling and how old it was. Quickly this news of the spirit spread around the neighbourhood. Margaret invited the locals into the house to experience the phenomena for themselves and it wasn't long before the entire story was laid out for the Fox family and the curious men and women of Hydesville. The deceased peddler had made himself known as Mr Charles B. Rosner, murdered in the cellar of the house by a local man named Bell who had previously lived there. The cellar was promptly excavated but no body was found, however the knocking did continue and so too did the enthusiasm for the curious otherworldly conversation. It was decided that the communications were linked somehow with the young girls and they were sent to New York and submitted to various tests, split up and sent to live with their older siblings. Interest in the girls' talents continued to grow, especially amongst the small Rochester community of Quakers, helped along by Amy and Isaac Post, long-time friends of the Fox family, and it quickly turned what had begun as a small family affair into small private gatherings and eventually blew up into wider public exhibitions, complete with strangers paying to witness the girls' communication with the dead. By 1850, the young girl's reputation had grown to such an extent in New York, performing to prominent members of polite society, that they now found themselves painted as spirit mediums, regarded by many as the preeminent of their kind and the couple had spawned a host of fans and imitators. The girls began touring cities throughout New York, and as they travelled, the word of their talent spread, along with the grandiosity of their mission. Fans became followers, and spiritualism, the belief that spirits of the dead exist with both the ability to contact the living and the will to dole out their moral and intellectual knowledge, was born. The problem with all of this was, of course, that the Fox sisters were a fraud, and the entire affair had been the case of a prank that had spiralled severely out of hand. In its earliest days, the concept of spiritualism was often valued as a loose, unorganised set of beliefs for and of the people. Despite many of its earliest followers' middle and upper class leanings, it was a religion that was often seen to shun stuffy class hierarchies, as well as typical gender biases, holding many women as prominent figures during a time that saw women largely marginalised by the traditional male-dominated structures of traditional spiritual bodies. Mid-19th century America had seen a series of revivalist movements challenge orthodox religion on the grounds of several social movements. Prominent amongst these were the abolition of slavery and women's rights, both of which were seen to be constantly overlooked by traditional churches. Amongst the congregations, Many of the more radical believers branched out, seeking to square both their spiritual existence with their sense of social morality. At the same time, industrialization and large-scale immigration saw people look to embrace a new drive for individualism. Rapid scientific experimentation and invention within the realms of electricity and telegraphy fueled an atmosphere that suggested to the layman that anything could be possible. Within this forward-thinking environment, and helped along by its founders of radical thinkers and activists, spiritualism continued to grow amongst reformist circles, making it an organisation often associated with progressive movements. It was a threat to established religions, not only due to what it could offer to its followers on a spiritual level, but also what it could offer them on a social and moral level too. It challenged established religions' authority and decentralised spirituality, it could entertain, provide solace and hope. It often aligned itself with contemporary scientific advancements, helping it to appear both credible and enlightened, and it championed social causes that were considered by many as the inevitable and most welcome future. It was, 
especially in the northeastern states, a fashionable force to be reckoned with, and in no time at all, it saw itself with the following that whilst difficult to track due to its unorganised nature, is believed to have extended into the millions. Spiritualism, as a recognisable movement, did have a fundamental problem that threatened its intense growth. The belief's unorganised nature saw it difficult to perpetuate outside of its northeastern hotspots of Boston and New York, and eventually it did begin to see a waning of interest. Just as interest in spiritualism began to dwindle, however, the bells of war rang out, signalling the bloody clash of the Civil War. As the bodies piled up on battlefields across North America, totalling over three quarters of a million dead, interest with the spiritualist movement would find itself once more renewed as belief in an ever-living, evolving afterlife gave welcome solace to a nation that was slipping into a deep mourning. Death was becoming easier to address in conversation as news of bloody battles hit the mass press, whilst photographers set out to embed with soldiers in order to bring home the true devastation of war. Spiritualist beliefs were once again a great comfort, and many practices that leaned heavily into those beliefs saw a sharp increase in interest. Seances, spirit writing, and various other forms of communicating with the dead once again became a popular pastime. It's amongst this atmosphere that Bostonite William H. Mumler, an engraver by trade, stumbled into a situation that, not entirely unlike the Fox sisters' earlier tale of shenanigans, quickly spiralled into a grand tale of smoke, mirrors and spirits from the other side. Born in 1832 to John and Susan Mumler, a pair of confectioners working in Boston, Massachusetts, William H. Mumler lived a quiet and unassuming life, working as an engraver of jewellery and high-end metalwork under Messrs Bigelow Brothers and Kennard, a well-to-do jeweller's advertising rich jewellery, fine watches and gems from their upscale storefront in Washington Street. For the period, it was an extremely well-paid, high-skilled position. Bigelow's had been in operation since before Mumler was born, and the shop's reputation saw Mumler engraving goods that were shipped across the nation to clients as far as New Mexico and the West Coast. William Mumler was a creative at heart, and the age's propensity to encourage experimentation and invention often led him down quite disparate paths. Suffering from dyspepsia, one of his most successful and, as it would turn out, fateful inventions was that of a stomach remedy that was based on an old German recipe which he sold locally under the inventive name of Mumler's German Remedy. He advertised this medicine locally in the Boston classifieds. It had come as a great relief for his own ailments and what seemed to work for him worked well enough for the locals too, and his miracle cure afforded him enough money to spring out on his own and start his own engraving business. Whether by coincidence or design, William's new store sat just a few doors up on Washington Street from a small photography studio run by Hannah Stewart, a young portrait artist who William had met and took a shine into via Bigelow and Kennards which had been situated lower down on Washington Street. Hannah's studio was one of hundreds of Boston studios, specialising in taking portraits of punters in a pastime that had boomed with recent advancements in photography. When Louis-Jacques Daguerre introduced his daguerreotype process to the world in 1839 in Paris, Samuel Morse, the American inventor of the telegraph, took a keen interest. Visiting Paris to promote his own invention, He saw the announcement of the new technology, and fearing the competition it may bring to telegraphy, he met with Daguerre and was given a tour of the photographer's studio, where he was introduced to both the results and the process firsthand. He later wrote a letter to his brother that would go on to be the first published first-hand account of the technology in America. It is one of the most beautiful discoveries of the age. I don't know if you recollect some experiments of mine in New Haven many years ago, when I had my painting room next to Professor Silliman's. Experiments to ascertain if it were possible to fix the image of the camera obscura. I was able to produce different degrees of shade on paper dipped into a solution of nitrate of silver by means of different degrees of light. But finding that light produced dark and dark light, I presumed the production of a true image to be impracticable and gave up at the attempt. Monsieur Daguerre 
has realised in the most exquisite manner this idea. Upon publication of this letter in the New York Observer, which was quickly syndicated across the country, Morse was not the only budding photographer who salivated at the invention's potential for commercial success. Until now, people were still paying good money for miniature portrait painters for a copy of their image. With this new photographic process, the same could be achieved with a perfect likeness in a fraction of the time at a fraction of the cost, bringing the possibility of owning their own pocket-sized portrait to the masses. The biggest problem initially with this potential, however, was the sheer length of time it took to expose a sitter to the silver plates that captured the image. Early attempts saw contraptions strapped to the backs of chairs that held the sitter's head firmly still. However, this did nothing to solve the image of blinking. Simply put, the living were not good subject matter for the early daguerreotypes. Whilst this did create an interesting niche of capturing the image of the deceased, Morse was still keen to bring it to the more numerous living. Teaming up with John William Draper, a medical doctor and professor at the University of New York, Morse set about opening a photography studio in the room of the university building, complete with a glass ceiling, which they named a Palace for the Sun. This studio was the first of its kind to offer portrait photography, boasting of improving the original daguerreotype to the point that they could capture the images of living humans quite perfectly. In the early days, Morse and Draper charged up to $5 an image, and whilst the venture was commercial to a degree, it was essentially an experimental process that utilised many imported pieces of equipment, exotic chemicals, and catered largely to the more well-off gentry of New York. Despite this, the pair were kept busy, capturing the images of the upper middle classes when weather permitted, and teaching their processes to others on days when the clouds obscured the light that they so desperately needed in order to keep the exposure time down. Morse and Draper's partnership in photography continued for a year before they split, with Draper wishing to return to his focus on teaching. However, Morse pressed on with his venture, experimenting and improving. At the same time, as other photographers learnt the process of portraiture, similar glass roof studios sprang up across America, popularising the miniature portrait, helping to bring costs down and improving the process rapidly. Back in Boston, Hannah Stewart had opened her own studio several years later. By the 1860s, the cost of having a photographic portrait made was reachable to every level of society, becoming a common and popular pastime for those leisure seekers with a few cents to spare. Photographic studios had popped up on almost every corner of the American city, and Boston was no different. Hannah's mother was a spiritualist medium by trade, and though Hannah took photos in her studio as her main income, she too advertised her secondary services as a spiritualist healer, an occupation that saw her speaking with the deceased spirit of a man named Dr. Benjamin Rush, who aided her in diagnosing her clients. Boston had, over the past 30 years, become something of the capital of spiritualism, and whilst its popularity had waned toward the ends of the 1850s, submitting Boston to the butt of many a joke, with the outbreak of the Civil War, the spiritualist resurgence once again saw Boston's spiritualist communities boom. For a healer like Hannah, mixing the two very different businesses was not, therefore, altogether unusual and rarely seen as anything but a boon. For William Mumler, spiritualism was nothing more than a novelty. He was once quoted as saying that for him, as far as most spiritualists were concerned, I was always ready for a joke. His admiration for Hannah lay in other areas, not least of which was her knowledge of photography. At weekends, he began to work at her studio as an assistant, cleaning the plates and learning the photographic process for himself. At the same time, he could spend time with Hannah, who was recently widowed after her husband was killed in the battle whilst fighting for the 53rd Regiment in Louisiana. Working as her assistant during his free time, William took photos when he could, often of himself, and spent much of his time in the studio tinkering with the development process of the completed images. As an amateur, his early photographs were entirely unremarkable. However, this would all change with one image in the summer of 1862. It was a Sunday, late in August, and under the blazing summer sun, 
The studio was full of usable light. Grasping the moment, William set up the camera, slid the glass plate into the contraption and opened the shutter. He quickly stepped in front of the lens, held his position as best as he could and then he tossed himself back out of the frame to close down the shutter and stop the exposure. As he developed the image, the sodium thisulfate cleared away the obscured image. The familiar visage of himself peering back slowly appeared, only in this photo he wasn't the only subject. Standing behind him, there seemed to be a ghostly image of a young woman, a young woman that he recognised. Alarmingly, he felt for sure it was that of his cousin. However, his cousin was already dead. The outline of the upper portion of the body is clearly defined, though dim and shadowy. The chair is seen distinctly through the body and arms, also the table upon which one arm rests. Below the waist, which apparently is clothed in a dress with low neck and short sleeves, fades away into a dim mist, which simply clouds the lower part of the picture. This description of the photo came from Dr Gardner, William's friend, who had seen the picture back in William's engraving shop a few days later. For William, he thought the photograph an interest in novelty, but nothing more. He claimed to Gardner that the result was simply unaccountable, and he chalked it up to an accident or mistake made somewhere in the process of preparing the plate for the image. Perhaps, he considered, he had not cleaned the plate correctly before he had started. Regardless, he had printed a copy to paper in order to show his friends and enjoy their reactions of himself sitting in a photograph with a ghost. Gardner failed to find the amusement in it, and he asked William if he could borrow the image to show some of his spiritualist friends, asking him also to write testimony on the rear of the small black and white photo. This photograph was taken of myself, by myself, on Sunday, when there was not a living soul in the room beside me. The form on my right I recognise as my cousin, who passed away about 12 years since. To William's slight shock, Gardner's spiritless friends were not quite as private as he had first imagined when he agreed to lend out the photograph. Within a week, a description of the photograph was printed in the New York spiritualist newspaper, The Herald of Progress. This might have slipped by the attention of William had it not been for the Boston spiritualist rag, The Banner of Light, reprinting the article word for word on the 18th of November, amending it to add the name and location of Hannah's studio where the photo had been taken. If William was concerned how Hannah might react to the new influx of spiritualist interest in her studio, he needn't have worried. She had already decided outright that the image absolutely was that of the spirit of William's cousin and welcomed the attention her studio was receiving from the local spiritualist community. Meanwhile, Gardner, who perhaps belatedly decided it might be a good idea to verify the veracity of the newly penned spirit photography, sat for a new portrait by the hand of William. This time, not only one ghostly image hovered behind the living sitter, but three. Gardner took the resulting photograph to another Boston photographer, James Wallace Black, to see what he made of it. Black had risen to fame in the photography world a few years prior when he filled a hot air balloon and took to the skies to record America's first aerial photographs, showing the people of Boston their city from high above. Looking at the unbelievable photograph in his hands, he simply shook his head. As far as he could say, he knew of no way that William had doctored the image to create the ghosts. Intrigued, Black sent his own assistant, Horace Weston, to Hannah's studio in order to have him sit for a photo and inspect Mumler as he carried out his process. When Horace returned to Black with a photo of himself flanked by the spirit of his dead father, he told him simply, I have seen nothing different from taking an ordinary picture. It was certainly curious. However, everyone at Black Studio was still a little more sceptical than the larger spiritualist community. They may not have been able to tell how William had duped them, but they were quite sure that he had somehow done just that. Fortunately for them, in article after article, William had mentioned that he was happy to welcome investigation into the matter. The whole thing is a marvel anyway and deserves to be investigated by scientific men. From the description given to us, Mr and Mrs Mumler are perfectly frank, ingenious persons with no appearance of imposture about them. They court the most rigorous investigation 
and will extend every facility for inquiry to persons coming properly accredited. Black decided to do exactly that, and he visited the studio for himself. Up front with his curiosities and suspicions, William agreed to photograph Black, and even offered him to not only inspect the camera, but to take it apart and examine it piece by piece. Black shrugged off the suggestion, but watched him carefully throughout, and then once he had finished sitting, once more turned down William's offer of developing the plate for himself. However, he did follow William to the darkroom and continued to watch him as he worked. His reason for turning down such an intimate investigation as he was offered was simply one of arrogance. For Black, he was a serious and well-respected photographer. He was quite sure that if William was pulling any trickery, he would recognise it immediately. You are not smart enough to put anything on that negative without my detecting it he told William, with no small amount of disdain. William replied by handing over a photograph of Black, sitting in a chair with the spirit of a woman standing behind him, with one hand on his shoulder. He told the photographer simply that he need not pay him for the pleasure. As William Mumler rose to spiritualist fame and Hannah's studio climbed into notoriety throughout Boston and the wider area, the pair who had for some time been growing closer eventually married on October 12, 1864. William closed down his engraving shop and turned instead to work full-time in the photographic studio, offering his spirit photographs at $10 a turn, whilst Hannah operated as both receptionist to streamline the business and spiritualist healer to a captive clientele. Not everyone was so willing to accept Williams' photograph as the real deal, and there were equally sceptical pieces in the press suggesting trickery, but for the most part, the overwhelming noise was that of positive support. If William ever failed to deliver on producing a ghostly image for a client, this too simply worked to bolster his legitimacy. The fact that he was so down to earth and had no previous history of spiritualism was not overlooked either. For every negative press piece on the studio or every naysayer in the bars and streets of Boston, there was someone willing to see the spirits of their lost loved ones in the images and speak out for him. One example, among many, is this testimony from Eliza Babbitt, a prominent Bostonite of the time that was published extensively in the spiritualist press. This is to certify that I, Mrs. Babbitt, have a spirit photograph of my husband, taken at your rooms by Mr. Mumler. It is recognised by all that have seen it who knew him when he was upon this earth as a perfect likeness, and I am myself satisfied that his spirit was present, although invisible to mortals. One of the more interesting elements was how the recipients of the images were always keen to point out that the ghosts in the pictures were always perfect likenesses of loved ones that they recognised with consistent ease. Just as with the press coverage, however, it was not all who accepted Williams' work so easy, and as his photos rose in fame, so too did the number of challenges from sceptics equally rise. William soon found himself becoming something of a target. A poster child for the spiritualist movement, sceptics saw him as prime material to investigate. If they could debunk William and his photographic process, they could, in turn, debunk all of spiritualism at the same time. It wasn't even just sceptics who spoke out about the work William was doing with his camera. There were many prominent spiritualists who spoke out against the photographs, either through competition, jealousy or protectionism. There were several who spoke out to the press, reminding the public to maintain a questioning eye on the images. Andrew Jackson Davis, a prominent New York spiritualist and magnetic healer, sent his own assistant, William Gee, a photographer by trade, to Boston to check into Williams' work for himself. It was a curious move, but as a long-time spiritualist and publisher of material around the subject, it was more than probable that it was motivated in no small part by a professional curiosity mixed with a twinge of jealousy. Guy sat for a photograph with William in his Boston studio, and as so many before him had already done, watched carefully at every step of the process. William, as before, offered Guy to get involved with the process, and he even allowed him to prepare his own plate for the image. I took my seat in such a position as to see everything going on. Being seated profile, I could see pretty well the background and also the camera box. Mr Mumler by it and the young man off in the corner 
having previously made sure that there was nobody else besides us three. The focus being adjusted, I resolve and hope that the picture of my departed wife may come on the negative standing in front and by me. The cloth being removed, I fancied feeling rather queer during the operation. The sitting over, I immediately passed to the camera box, took out the plate holder, passed off to the dark room, followed by Mr. Mumler. I must here mention that while I was preparing the glass and going through the operation, I pretty nearly made up my mind that nothing but my own picture would come on, and even when about to develop the same, I little believed that I should get anything more. Having thrown on a developing solution, I closely watched what was coming. Well, then, to my utmost almost trembling astonishment, there I was seeing two pictures come out. I clasped the glass tightly. You may rest assured. Having got through, I washed it off and put it into the fixing solution, watching it closely all the while. When done, I took it out, and there I stood, and precisely what I had desired. You may better conceive my feelings than I can even now explain to you. Unbelieving at what he was seeing in the dark room, Guy asked to sit once more, and the second time developed a second photograph, this time with the spirit of his deceased father realised, posing in the frame beside him. The result was a resounding endorsement from the photographer, published in press both in America and across the world. I cannot detect a single syllable that goes to prove any fraud. Mr Mumler expresses a desire that I should be with him all the time, so that I may see how the work is done, having great confidence in my skill as a photographer. It is impossible for Mr Mumler to have procured any pictures of my wife or my father. The likeness of my father is clear and perfect, that of my wife is not. I have seen several letters from parties who have gone through as I have and received satisfaction, certifying their failure to detect any possible detection. Guy was so impressed by the entire operation, in fact, that he ended up working at the studio in some assistant capacity in order to better improve the entire process for their now never-ending stream of clients. Like any good entrepreneur, William was not so happy with settling or stagnating. Instead, he branched out into mail-order photography, charging people $7.50 for the pleasure of having a photograph of a spirit of a person that they described sent to them no matter where they were in the nation. William sent his photos to all manner of people, including the legendary entertainer and master of the American humbug, P.T. Barnum himself. Just as his notoriety with Boston was reaching its peak, however, the spirit photographer hit a small hitch. On the 12th of February, 1865, one of the studio's visiting clients was perusing the gallery of previous photographs whilst awaiting his turn to sit in front of the camera upstairs, when he noticed something curious in one of the photos. There, posing as a spirit, was the perfect image of his wife. What was more curious was that this wife was still very much alive. This wasn't an isolated experience either. Worse for William was the revelation that John Latham, a visitor to the offices of the spiritualist newspaper The Banner of Light, saw one of Mumler's photographs on the editor's desk. He was convinced that the spirit was someone that he knew or had seen before. It nagged on his mind for days after until he finally put two and two together and recognised it not as someone that he knew, but that he had seen the same spirit in a different photograph belonging to a Mr Pollock. Investigating the image further, he discovered someone that recognised the spirit and once more it turned out that this spirit was the image of someone very much alive and well. As it happened, the ghostly image was of a previous client to Hannah's studio long before William had moved in and shot his first ever spirit photograph. With the original photograph as direct proof that the spirit in Pollock's photo was a fraud, William's blooming reputation as a talented medium crashed spectacularly. Guy left the studio overnight and whilst the press lampooned him as an out-and-out fraud, William quietly backed away from the argument, stepping out of the public spotlight and hastening him back into quiet obscurity. Debate raged on without the input of William for a while, but eventually, with no defence of the work being offered by the man himself, the realm of spirit photography fell once more into obscurity. All the while that the Boston spiritualist community were turning in on William Mumler and his photographic process, 
miles away in New York, P.T. Barnum was busy setting up a new gallery in his American museum. He had received an image from William via his mail order service and become enamoured by the entire affair. Whilst one state derided William as a heartless, humanityless, tomb-robbing ghoul, Barnum was pronouncing him an ingenious man of science. During the summer of 1865, he displayed an entire gallery of Mumler's photos to the public, whilst Mumler himself hid away from the public eye, doctoring photos of the Confederate President Jefferson Davis, outfitting him in a woman's dress to sell via mail order. The photos were a satirical take on the capture and arrest of the ruined leader from the spring of that year. In reality, the dress was only his wife's shawl, thrown over his head and shoulders at the last moment to obscure him from the invading army in the hopes he would evade capture. However, the press had run with the story and created a farce of the scene to great effect. For photographers with an inventive streak, much like William Mumler, it was a commercial opportunity too good to pass up. When Barnum's museum burnt down later that summer, it would not have been a devastating blow to William to find out that the gallery, full of the body of work that he had been attempting to distance himself from, had also gone up in flames along with it. Over the next few years, William passed the time quietly. Always a tinkerer, he invented several small mechanical instruments and processed at least four new patents, and for the most part, he appeared to put photography behind him. That was until 1868 at least, when his old assistant, William Gee, showed up on his doorstep in Boston, bankrupt and looking for work. With some very gentle prodding, Mumler was convinced to step once more into the world of spirit photography. With their local reputation in tatters, this time, he reasoned, the outfit would need to get out of Boston, and so instead began advertising a national tour of big cities, starting off in New York. Just a few blocks up from Barnum's rebuilt America Museum, the trio found a space to rent in W.W. Silver's photographic studio on 630 Broadway. Silver was a legitimate portrait photographer who had been in the business for over six years, and when he first discovered the type of operation that William Mumler intended to run from his premises, he was not in the least bit impressed. At least, he was unimpressed until he sat for a photograph himself. Watching William with a close eye, he sat back and awaited the results to emerge from the darkroom, only to be astounded to see that his image now contained the spirit of his dead mother. Convinced by this, his tune changed appreciably, and Mumler's way was clear to ply his spiritualist trade to a new audience. William charged $10 for 12 prints, and though this was three times the going rate for normal portrait photography at the time, the studio was soon filled to the rafters with people gagging to try out this fantastical new fad. Within the space of weeks, Silver's studio was as busy as Hannah's had ever been back in Boston, helped along by some positive press coverage. This may be a humbug, one story read, but I am too stupid to discover it myself. Just as it had before, Mumler's process attracted not only paying clientele, but also the critical eye of his peers. Photographers were soon pouring over his images and sending their assistants to sit for photos, eagerly awaiting their feedback, hoping in hope that this time they might be the one clever enough to uncover Mumler's special secret. None were successful, however, and his popularity continued to grow after they had been in New York for a year. The Photographic Section, a group of professional photographers based in New York, set up an exhibition with a selection of Williams' photos. In order to advertise himself to the punters, William prepared a pamphlet that explained his unique ability. It is now some eight years since I commenced to take these remarkable pictures, and thousands, embracing as they do scientific men, photographers, judges, lawyers, doctors, ministers, and in fact, all grades of society, can bear testimony to the truthful likeness of their spirit friends they have received through my mediumistic power. What joy the troubled heart what balm to the aching breast, what peace and comfort to the weary soul, to know that our friends who have passed away can return and give us unmistakable evidence of a life hereafter, that they are with us and seize with avidity every opportunity to make themselves known. But alas, in many instances, that old door of sectarianism has closed against them and prevents their entering once more the portals of their loved ones and be identified. 
But thank God, the old door is fast going to decay. It begins to squeak on its rusty and time-worn hinges. Its panels are penetrated by the wormholes of many ages, through which the bright, effulgent rays of the spiritual sun begin to shine, and in a short time it will totter and tumble to the earth. Boston has been the field of my labours most of the time since I commenced taking these wonderful pictures, where I have been visited by people from all parts of the Union. But at the earnest solicitation of my many friends, I have concluded to make a tour through the principal cities of the United States, that all may avail themselves of this opportunity to obtain a likeness of their loved ones. It was a bold mission statement, but one that would hopefully keep him moving, keep him earning, and keep him one step ahead of all the naysayers that so insistently followed him around. At least, it would have, but his Grand National Tour was about to be derailed by an Irish immigrant journalist who saw nothing but the work of the devil in each photograph. In the 1860s, New York was headed by a mayor that was hoping to clean up the city's act. Part of his plan to do so was to install a complaints book in the town hall offices that was open to the public to write their complaints in. This book was jam-packed with complaints of petty criminals, anonymous conmen and domestic squabbles. It was the job of Joseph H. Tucker, the city marshal, to head up a team of a dozen assistants to trawl through this book, separating the useful complaints from the droll bickering. In March of 1869, one story stuck out in the complaints to both Tucker and the mayor himself. The complaint came from one Patrick V. Hickey, an Irish journalist who wrote for the New York Sun on affairs in relation to science. As well as priding himself as a man of science, he was a devout Catholic, and from the moment he had seen William Mummler's spirit photographs, he had taken deep offence at what the man was doing. He first saw William's photos in the photographic section gallery, after which he had paid Mummler's studio a visit, and then immediately marched over to City Hall to lodge his complaint with the authorities against William. For Tuca and the mayor, they saw William as little more than a straight con man, and so, at the mayor's request, Tuca began an investigation into William personally. He visited Silver's studio under cover of a false name to get a photo taken by William. Using his nom de plume of William Wallace, he explained how he wished to see the spirit of his father-in-law, paid a $2 deposit, sat for the photos, and then, the next morning, returned to collect his developed photos. The moment William handed over the photos, complete with the marshal's fictional father-in-law, Tuca arrested William for fraud and took him straight to the tombs to await a preliminary hearing. Mumler's trial was set up with due haste and two weeks after his initial preliminary hearing, William was whisked off to stand in defence for obtaining money by trick and fraud. In his defence, he had hired John D. Townsend, a fearless lawyer who had gained a reputation for fighting lost causes and winning. As one can imagine, the trial was a public spectacle, followed by a packed courthouse and the international press. The trial opened up with Tuca taking the stand to explain how he had come into contact with William's photographic process and to address the charges against him. Well, when I went into the room... Certain representations were made to me which were not afterwards carried out as promised. Mr Mumler promised to give me a picture of a relative or of someone deceased near in sympathy to me. This he failed to do, and I therefore consider that this was a trick and a deception practised on me. William's defence was quick to seize the initiative, pouncing on Tuca's use of a fake name, which was explained away by, by Tuca stating that he did not want to colour any treatment made towards him if his name as the city marshal was recognised. More damning, however, was the revelation dug out through questioning that he had never actually seen his father-in-law whilst he had been alive. This, explained Townsend, surely meant that he cannot know if the likeness in the photograph was in fact that of his father-in-law or not. With a heavy sigh, Tuca could do little but to declare that, yes, that was in fact the truth of the matter. Next to the stand was William Gee, who backed William to the hill explaining how he had met the photographer eight years prior and had been so moved to end up working alongside him. Though I tested the process by every means I could desire, I could find no trick or evidence. I became convinced that the spectral pictures appearing on photographs of living persons were actually and the true likenesses of those departed. 
and were produced by means other than those known by artists. I know of two or three methods of producing ghost-like figures similar to these, one by placing a person behind the sitter, another by a peculiar arrangement of reflections, and a third by chemical means. Once he had furnished the courtroom with his photographic knowledge, he then went on to assure the judge that he was quite sure that William had not made use of any of the means he had described. He wasn't the only expert to take the stand over the course of the trial either, and several prominent photographers gave similar statements to the court, suggesting ways that a photographer could potentially make a spirit photograph in the same vein, but then going on to assure the court that they did not believe that William had utilised any of them himself. Equally, springing to William's defence was a steady stream of happy clientele, all spiritualists from New York, many prominent figures in society, who gave testimony that they were more than happy with the process and of having partook in a mumla shoot. One of the most prominent to be called to witness was the Honourable W. Edmonds, a 70-year-old judge from New York who was widely respected. Himself a spiritualist, he managed to garner such a level of respect for his other endeavours that even a retelling of a somewhat deluded spiritualist yarn in the courtroom could not stand against him in the opinions of even the prosecution who held him in great esteem. As an expert witness, William Slee was called to the stand. A photographer from Poughkeepsie for over 10 years, he was to give his technical opinion on Mumla's photographs, but he too could only admit that out of curiosity, he had previously invited Mumla to his own studio and offered up all his equipment to him to attempt to take a spirit photograph in a controlled environment. When the photograph was finally produced by William, complete with ghostly visitor, Slee could only say that though he thought it was possible for a photographer to create the photographs using natural techniques, it would have been very difficult. The trial was not to go completely in William's favour, however. It was time for the prosecution to call their star witness. Despite his earlier admiration of Mumla, P.T. Barnum could not resist the lure of publicity for testifying against him in a public court. As soon as the first question of him was asked, he launched into an answer which would characterise the flair he had intended to bring to the trial. Do you believe in spooks? The prosecutor asked Barnum. I do. It's very easy to see them if you only believe in them. When I was a boy, I believed in them and saw lots of them. His reply drew laughter from the onlookers and danced gracefully around any question of his own beliefs. As it happened... Barnum had always been an outspoken critic of spiritualism, but perhaps with a captive audience, he felt it better to string them along to the inevitable punchline and what a punchline it was to be. After a long speech concerning the subject of seeing and believing, Barnum produced a photograph of himself with the spirit of the recently assassinated President Lincoln standing behind him. It was not a Mumla photograph, he assured the court, but was taken just like Mumler would have taken his spirit photographs. Throughout the sitting, he assured the court that he had seen no trickery whatsoever, just like all the experts had previously said of Williams. But there it was, an image of himself so absurd that it simply cannot have been real. The photograph was, of course, a great cause of amusement to the court, but it was also a damaging image against Williams' defence. It tore down the legitimacy of his argument and turned spirit photography into a clear farce. On the 1st of May, the prosecution and defence rose to give their closing statements. It was the turn of Townsend for the defence first. Mumler is charged with fraud because the prosecution cannot understand how the spirit form was produced, and owing to the fact that Tuka and those who testify on the part of the people are unable to account for the appearance of these shadowy forms. Therefore, it is sought to hunt down the prisoner and fix on him the brand of cheat and humbug. Townsend then went on to ask why a case which should have been comparatively small was blown to such grand proportions. He suggested that the case was no longer against Mumla but against spiritualism and belief itself. It was a fairly effective line and he paired it with another by pointing to the long line of prominent experts and New York high society who had lined up to testify for the defence despite Williams' short time living in New York. On the other hand, he pointed out that the prosecution had brought forward Barnum, 
a man who was well known to fraud people openly. He then closed by suggesting that his spiritualism was on trial, that he believed it not to be the problem that it was often seen as, calling to the Bible and reading scripture directly that supported the communication with the dead. If the spiritual belief is true, then we must admit that there is nothing to Mumla's works to justify the charge brought against him. Spiritualists found their belief in the Bible. If we believe in the Bible, we cannot fail to believe that spirits do appear, at times, and are palpable to the sight of these mortals gifted with the power of seeing them. It was a fairly powerful and convincing argument. In retaliation, the defence closed with a statement that focused on the simple matter of fraud, calling Mumler's racket a wholesale swindle and bracketed it amongst many other cons that the city was pushing to expel in order to protect its citizens. When all was said and done, the judge made his deliberations. After careful attention to the case, I have come to the conclusion that the prisoner should be discharged. However, I might believe that trick and deception has been practiced by the prisoner. As I sit here in my capacity of magistrate, I am compelled to decide that the prosecution has failed to prove the case. It had been a long, drawn out and very public trial, but at the end of it, William Mumler was ruled an innocent man, free to go about his own way. As it had been in Boston in the years prior, Mumler found his reputation forever tarnished in New York, despite the innocent verdict. He returned to Boston, where he advertised mail-order spirit photographs for sale. The Mumler studio itself instead turned more towards Hannah's spiritualist healing abilities, which they advertised openly and saw a decent trade. In keeping with his inventive nature, Mumler went on to develop the Mumler process, a photographic technique that significantly cheapened and made more efficient the printing of photographs, which was widely adopted by newspapers nationwide. Despite casting aside spirit photography for the most part, he captured probably his most famous photograph three years after his trial ended, when he shot an image of President Lincoln's widow, a prominent spiritualist herself. She had visited the Mumler studio one morning in the spring of 1872, and she left with a photo of herself along with the ghost of the dead president hovering over her left shoulder. William Mumler died in 1884, aged 51 years old. His obituary made only passing mention of his spirit photography, instead focusing more on the Mumler process, for which he had gained considerable fame. The description of him as having much innate genius and a taste for experiment only alluded to the days gone when he would see his clients in front of a camera and then produce an image of ghosts pulled from thin air. So that was the story of William Mumler, which I really enjoyed and still perplexes me to some degree. I mean, I don't believe it, but there's a lot of stuff in there that perplexes me. So we're going to chat about that a little bit after these short ads. Thanks for listening to Dark Histories. This podcast is entirely independent and funded by myself and listener support. So in order to do that, I need to run a few ads. Our long-time advertising partner is Audible, and the reason I've stuck with them for so long is that they offer a service that I actually use and enjoy myself. And I do think it actually offers value to people like myself who enjoy podcasts. If you're unaware of what Audible is, it's an audiobook subscription service which charges a monthly fee in return for one credit, which you're free to spend on any audiobook you like. The catalogue is huge, multilingual, and covers everything from fiction to series of lectures. They have an iOS, Android and web app, and if you use more than one, they all sync up together so that you can listen on any of your devices without having to skip about. If you ever feel like you want to take a break from the subscription, you can do so and you get to keep all your previously bought books. And when you get into a drought, you can just fire it up again and start gaining credits seamlessly. Some of my favourite books on there to date are The Complete Sherlock Holmes, which is read by Stephen Fry. And they've also got the original Exorcist book and just a huge history back catalogue. And I've really enjoyed all of those, basically. So if this sounds like something you might be interested in, 
head over to audible.com forward slash dark histories and that's dark histories all one word and you can start a free trial that offers a monthly subscription with one free credit so that you can instantly pick an audiobook of your choice if at the end of the trial you feel like it's not really for you you can just cancel it and it's cost you nothing and you get to keep your free book so once again that's audible.com forward slash dark histories or you can find the link in the show notes So earlier I mentioned listener support and there are a ton of ways that you can get involved and support Dark Histories. The main way is to become a Patreon patron. If you listen to a lot of podcasts, I'm sure you're familiar by now, but for those not so much, Patreon is a way to make a monthly pledge in return for some small perks. On the Dark Histories Patreon, I set my pledges as low as I can really with options for one, three and five dollars per month. And for that, You gain things like early access episodes without these horrible ads, PDF notes and resources that I make and find during my research for each episode. There's also access to the live stream archives and more. So if you enjoy the show and you think it's worth it to you, hop over to darkhistories.com and you can find all the ways that you can support, including our Patreon, or just check out the links in the show notes. If none of that appeals, then sharing it around with all your friends and family is equally as helpful and just as much appreciated. So if you're here, then thanks so much for not skipping the ads with that 30 second skip button and giving my hard sell a listen. I'll let you get back to the episode. Cheers. Welcome back. So yeah, that's the story of William Mumler. I really enjoyed the story itself. I think it's great. And the photographs are great. I I definitely recommend you to check them out. They're just fantastic. They're obviously fraudulent. You know, they're totally not real. It's quite clear, you know, nowadays to see that they're they're just not real. But they're, they're fantastic. But there's a lot that perplexes me. Despite, say, obviously I realize they're not real. But there is stuff that really confuses me. And first of all, it's the fact that everyone seemed to, who got the photos and who testified, seemed to think that the person in the photograph was an exact likeness of who they wanted it to be. They always claimed like, oh, you know, I, I wanted it to be my husband or it was a photograph of my husband and they looked just like them and everyone said they looked like them too, you know. And I don't understand how he did that. Was it just a matter that the people that were looking in the photographs were seeing what they wanted to see? especially those that are in a state of mourning, did they just want to see the perfect image of their dead husband, for example? And so it was. Because the photos are fairly vague, but they're not that vague. And he must have got it reasonably close. And how did he do that? I find that fascinating. And he was obviously using old photographs of of other people. But he was getting more than... The sex, right, you know, he was he must have been getting at least roughly in the ballpark. Or you would think so, unless people were really kidding themselves. And maybe that's exactly it. Maybe that's the answer. People really were just truly kidding themselves. I don't think that's completely unlikely. But it is interesting. It's an interesting point, you know. So that, that, that was interesting. The other thing that really stuck out to me was how did he do it on... The photographer, William Slee, I think his name was. It was definitely Slee. So we'll just say Mr. Slee because I can't remember his first name. But how did he take the photo on Mr. Slee's equipment and still produce a spirit? Because to sort of lead on to another thing that confused me is just how he even did it in the first place. But you would think that it would have taken quite a lot of tinkering and bodging. And yet he went to a different photographer's studio used completely different equipment all owned by the other photographer and still produced an image that's quite impressive I mean that's a good hoax right he did pretty well so that was a really interesting sort of point of kind of confusion for me and then I say the last of it was how he just how did he do it you know it seems incredibly likely that he was using old photographs um, to sort of make some sort of double exposure and there are some explanations for how he did it and 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 they're quite various one uh, was uh, so in in the trial they had like the various photographers 
and that they all kind of explained how they might make an image that was like Mumler's. But they all said that they don't think that that was how he was doing it because various reasons it wasn't quite right, if you like. Uh, so, so one of them, for example, was using two negatives and then only exposing one, or, or, you know, exposing both of the negatives on one plate at the same time, uh, but only exposing one for a few seconds. So it just left like the ghostly kind of half image. But like I say, it, 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 they weren't perfect versions. They, they, they weren't sort of totally reflective of what he thought Mumler's photos were like. So and, and and this really goes to show. I think they come up with about six or seven ways that you could have done this, um, and but all of them said that they don't think that's how he did it. So how did he do it? Because I, I'm not sure. I I looked around quite a bit. I I'll be honest, it wasn't like my main focus of my research, but um, I, I didn't find any one that actually sort of showed because Mumla never admitted how he did it or explained how he did it. So I didn't find anyone that actually had a convincing argument i found a bunch of people that said this is how he did it but they were repeating stuff that was said in court i say like that none of those were ever confirmed as this is definitely how he did it so that 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 i thought was quite interesting the fact that he sort of hoaxed it and sort of managed to get away with it for a really 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 long time pretty much forever um because you know still now people are sort of guessing at how he how he did it um and and course everyone knows that they're frauds or whatever but they're not quite sure how he done it and and everyone i mean it could just be the fact that they are guessing it right and and one of those people in court who came out and said you know this he could do it like this but it, it wouldn't quite turn out right maybe they just were doing it in a slightly different way to him and they were like 99 percent bang on with what they were saying but mumla was just doing one little thing that was different that made the outcome slightly different um, and enough difference to make them doubt that that was what he was doing. Either way, it's fascinating. I mean, one another one, um, so another idea that they came out with is that he was getting someone to stand behind them, and but but then they would don't they would leave, so they would only be there for like sort of like say ten seconds of the sort of two or three minute long exposure, and then that would leave just like a ghostly image of them. But that's, I think that one's a, a dead rubber, right? That, that I'm pretty sure he didn't do that because they would have known. You know, everyone seemed surprised to get these photos. So, yeah, that, that seems like a dead rubber. There's quite a few things. For me, the, the main one is just how he managed to kind of nail it every time and get the right spirit. I, I guess he probably didn't nail it every time. So that's the other thing. You only ever hear the testimonies from people that sort of back him pretty much. Or the ones that where he spectacularly failed, you don't really get the the multitudes of testimonies from people that were perhaps in the middle or sort of unimpressed or whatever. You know, so you only ever hear the testimonies of people who were like bang on, like super hardcore spiritualists that totally believed in his work already and were like made up with it. And say perhaps they're a bit like the same with the people who were in sort of deep mourning or whatever, perhaps they just were seeing what they wanted to see. So it's difficult. Anyway, I found it fascinating. Um, I thought it was really interesting. And I, I thought, despite the fact that it's obviously a fraud and, and, and that's fine, I feel pretty comfortable not having the answers but still knowing that this was a fraud or still, you know, being able to say, like, com- with confidence that this was a fraud despite not having, any like, all the answers. But it's cool that... I don't have all the answers for it. And I still, you know, there's still, still little things that kind of drill away in my mind and go, well, how, how did he do that then? It's, 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 so I thought it was a really interesting story anyway. Um, so I really hope you enjoyed it. I, I think this one will probably get quite a bit of chat at the live stream this month. So yeah, look forward to that. There'll be much more information about the live stream and that on um, social media when we get it scheduled in and everything. So yeah, hopefully that'll be fun if you want to come along to that that'd be great if you do want to follow uh, me on social media pretty much dark histories everywhere if you just search it find the one with the butterfly that's me that's instagram facebook twitter all that kind of stuff um if you go to darkhistories.com you'll actually find links to everything including all the social um media you can find links to the discord and an explanation of that discord's a nice little community we got and 
also you'll be find, able to find the ways that you can support if you would like to do so. But obviously, you know, don't feel like you have to. So thanks very much for listening. I hope, say you enjoyed it. I'll see you all really soon. So until that point, stay healthy, stay well and sleep tight.